Great. So welcome everybody to this edition to the Dr. Tom Collins Show. And I am extremely honored to have my friend, Dr. Andrew Kaufman with me today. And I, you know, usually when people do intros, they say, Dr. Kaufman went to MIT and da 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 da. And I don't, I don't really like to do that. I would rather, if uh, Andy, if you're okay, I would like to describe my interaction with you and then you can correct it if you didn't hear it like that. Um, well, I think that's a lot more meaningful way to do it, Tom, so I appreciate it. Right. Okay, let me go. So the first thing I would say is if, if this situation we're in now were a Shakespearean play and we're looking back 10, 20, maybe even 100 or 200 years ago, and I must admit, I haven't decided yet whether this is a comedy or a tragedy, although I think it's, I think it's more towards the latter, but uh, there is some comic elements in it. Um, but one thing I'm sure of, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy, and we can all make our own guess as to who the villain is, but I can tell you, I know who the hero is, and that's Andy Kaufman, because, uh, I don't know anybody who's been able to articulate a clear and concise uh, understanding of what's happening like, like Andy. And so that's why I have appreciated his input so much. And what, what my connection was, so I have a little bit of a different style than Andy, which is I tend to think things and think that I'm correct. And I often have some evidence, but uh, I'm not as meticulous a researcher, I would say. So I, uh, a number of months ago, I made a video where I described that I was questioning and doubtful that actually viruses are pathogenic. And I actually said that uh, there's a different way of looking at illness, and I use the example of dolphins, and that if anybody went to a, a new place where dolphins were getting sick, and you had the choice between they have a genetic disease or they have a virus or somebody poisoned the water, I think most of us would say it's probably there's poison in the water. And I then uh, offered this possibility that these things we call viruses are the tissues or maybe the cells way of excreting poisons. And I, I've been thinking of that and had some evidence for that for 20 to 30 years. But I must admit, I didn't know the, the actual research on that. And so to my surprise, uh, that video was seen, I'm told, by 50 to 100 million people around the world, even though I thought I was saying it to 20 people in a room of mostly disinterested people at the end of a talk on uh, the heart. So anyways, that's what happened. And then I thought to myself, wow, I got to uh, deal with this. And then a few weeks later, a friend of mine sent me your first, I don't know if you call it a webinar or something. And apparently you had either heard that or something and decided to see, I wonder if this guy Tom is right. And uh, then you did the work that I hadn't done. I had a little bit of a knowledge about that. And it was an unbelievable relief for me and support for me to have your input into this to actually sort of fill in the details. And so I was extremely grateful for that. Uh, so then as a result of that, I called you up and some, said something like, hi, or how are you or something. And then I asked you how you came to this. And it was very interesting what you said. There was two things that struck me, and I don't know if you remember this. And again, please correct me if you think I, I'm mistaken here. But the first one was, you said, I don't say things publicly that I can't prove are correct. And I thought, fair enough. Uh, that's, that's, there you go. 
And the second was even more impactful for me, which was all I can say, and I'm paraphrasing here, is my experience didn't support what I was told and learned in medical school. And that was extremely important to me because I think we've all had that. Our experience of life doesn't actually match up with what we're told. But for some reason, most of us, you know, we're told basically not to believe our experience. We're taught not to believe our experience. And in my life, it's been so rare for somebody to say, you know, I I was told something, but it doesn't square up with what I'm seeing, so I don't believe it, or at least I looked into it. And those two things really, uh, I knew I was dealing with somebody who I could A, learn a lot from, and B, as I said, became really the hero of this story. So with that, welcome to my show. And please correct me if I got any of that incorrect. Well, no, I mean, I think you got it all correct. And thank you so much for telling this story. I just want to add a little bit to it because when I came across that um, 20 minutes at the end of your heart talk uh, video and you said a couple of things, and I think you did a follow-up uh, webinar um, that I also saw. And when I was watching that and you talked about this, I had like some kind of experience where I just suddenly knew that this was the truth of the matter. Um, and I had the whole thing worked out in my head, like almost instantly. And that is a very, very, uh, I've never had an experience like that before. Like I've had an experience like that when I study something and then get to a point where that finally soaks in and I understand it and I have that moment. Right. But this experience that I had this time, I didn't do that. Like I, I, I had been researching things about viruses, but I didn't get to that material, but I just knew that it was correct. And then, you know, for the next 48 hours, I spent like every waking moment researching and everything I found confirmed it. So it's like whatever way that you felt certain about that truth um, in that knowledge, it, it was real. Um, even though, right, you didn't do all the due diligence um, that I did about it, it still was real. <laughs> so it's like, I think this speaks to a bigger point that gets to what, what you were referring to about how do we you know, know what is right with knowledge? Um, how do we learn to trust our own observations, right? And I think sometimes it's referred to as ateticism where you know, you pay attention, use your own senses and your own critical thinking skills. And, and does that match up uh, with, you know, the prevailing theories? But another part of this is our intuition. And I believe that, you know, that's not something that our culture allows us or promotes us to really develop, but it is really important aspect. And, and I would, you know, say that my intuition was extremely strong in that experience. And it told me that this is truthful, way of thinking about things. And it turned out that it was. So, you know, there's a lot of lessons for all of us, uh, you know, through this whole experience, certainly. But yeah. uh, in this little uh, moment uh, of a breakthrough that I had. Great. You know, you know I, I so understand that. And I, I, I've had so many conversations with my wife when I get to the point where I say, you know, I, I just know this is correct. And it's, it's almost as if you're seeing a, a sort of a movie or you're seeing something. It's not quite a movie, but I see it in my, I, I don't even really like the word mind anymore. I just see it in, somehow I see it. Right. And, and she always says, so did you just make that up? And I say, <laughs> of course, what do you think? Like, you think I got this from somebody else? I mean, nobody else is crazy enough to think. <laughs> so, yeah, I just got, but... Not even Rudy Steiner. <laughs> yeah, right, because he contradicted himself all the time. So, uh, but, but then you can go, then you have to go back and say, because we all can delude ourselves, right? Absolutely. And, and we can go off and think things. And, you know, when I think back in many of my books, I, I'm, I like cringe, 
because right. how, how could I possibly have thought that? I, I can tell you though, every single thing, I think this is absolutely correct. Every single thing I got wrong in any of my books, it's because I believed the dominant narrative too much and I had something go off in me that said, this is probably not right, but uh, no. Everybody thinks this, so it must be true. Yeah. And, and I just sort of ignored that. And I, get, I basically got tired of doing that because it keeps leading me astray. And I don't like being led astray so much. Yeah, it's, it's a really difficult thing because the more you drill down into the basic uh, presumptions and paradigms of the current scientific narrative, right? The more you see that actually the evidence is not there and there are mistakes, but you have all this knowledge that's all founded, you know, that's the foundational knowledge. Everything else is built upon that. And it's sometimes it's hard to even make the connection. It's hard to change the vocabulary, yes. right? It's hard to always think things through. And so it's like this process of shifting to a different way of thinking about these um, issues, right? And people are at various stages along that process. And so it's really hard to communicate about because I don't want to like, you know, alienate people that are learning about this, but are still accepting a lot of the mainstream paradigms. Like I want them to be able to also say that part of what I'm saying is still truthful based on that. You don't have to go into as deep of a level to, you know, question uh, things that, that are presumptions of, you know, scientific principles like, like contagion and germ theory. Right. Um, right. Because it's hard to get to the point where you can challenge those things. Right. And, and I, I also agree there's, it's one of the reasons it's tricky is because the wording is all skewed towards seeing the world like that. We have lots of words that actually, um, almost configure the way we talk and configure the way we think. And, you know, you hear that when you hear about traditional people, they have like 20 different words for water because they have so many different conceptions of what the water is doing and who the water is. And so we don't have the words for that. So there becomes no way to conceptualize that or even communicate about it. Well, people uh, vastly underestimate the power of language because, you know, we um, really think in linguistic terms and our behavior is different based on the nature of our specific language that we are cultured to. And like there's some very interesting research on this. And one study just to briefly bring up is where they looked at uh, retirement savings because, you know, there are certain powers that be that, that want people to save more. Uh, for the future, and they looked at language differences, and there are some languages that don't have verb tenses. So in other words, like in, in Mandarin, I believe this is the case, where there's no future tense. So it turns out that in people who speak a language without a future tense have a much more likelihood of saving money for the future. Because they don't <laughs> the future in the present. Uh -huh. Whereas in cultures like ours, right? Like people, no way, man, I'm, I want to buy something now. Like, I don't want to save that money. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. so it really has a profound influence on how you experience certain information. And uh, it's important to acknowledge that. And I've definitely talked about many inversions of meaning, like uh, for example, with the word germ, um, you know, initially really meaning Genesis, new life, new growth. And now it means basically something that will, you know, possibly even kill you that invades you. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's, there's powerful clues in, in these, uh, uh, in these particular words and how the language is used. So can you give us a sense of your process in this, like how you went from, you know, whatever, 25-year-old college student. Uh, I mean, for me, I was like called Doubting Tom when I was 10. And, and so <laughs> I, 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 I tell this story when I was sent to uh, watch a friend of my father's who was a well-known internist in Detroit. And I was like 15 and he goes into the exam room 
and he, he uh, examines this woman and says, you know, you've got a cough. And she says, why do I have a cough? He says, because it's the bad air in Detroit. And she looks at him and says, so why don't you have a cough? And I started laughing. Of course, that was the last time he wanted me to follow him around. It, it, it's, but but I, I always had a sense that this, this isn't the whole story here. So I'm just wondering if you have a story that, uh, and like if things happened to you or how did you end up, or what did you see and how did you see it and what yeah. happened? Well, uh, you know, I, I think I do have like a, a better and better understanding of this. And um, I have to say that one of the major forces that motivates me, this is just part of my personality, is, is justice. So I'm very motivated by trying to correct injustices in the world. And that's what really led me into medicine. And I always thought about like, you know, who are people that are neglected in terms of their health? Like that's who... I want to work with, right? And that's what led me into psychiatry because, um, you know, people with schizophrenia and severe mental illness are very marginalized in our society and our culture. Um, and this uh, in, subsequently motivated me to want to work in the correctional system and take care of people with severe mental illness who happen to be stuck in a jail, yeah. um, right? Where no one is really looking out for them. And it's a horrible place to be. So all of uh, my major decisions have been influenced by that angle or they've had some attachment. And what happened is that as I started uh, practicing medicine um, and in this, even as a trainee, I started to see that there were some injustices. Like the first thing that really hit me was about civil commitment. And this is basically a law that allows a psychiatrist or some other doctor to basically incarcerate someone. Um, they can put them in a hot mental hospital against their will in a locked ward. Um, and based on, you know, their being illness and supposedly being dangerous to themselves. And there are situations, right, where this might actually be appropriate to some degree, although I would say there are better ways to do it. But what I saw was that doctors were using it not for real extreme emergencies, but using it as a matter of convenience or a matter of routine and or for the purpose of using police transport instead of medical transport because of financial incentives. Yeah. Right. So so that led me to question things and also be known as a troublemaker and have several people, you know, sit me down and tell me that I shouldn't be, you know, rocking the boat essentially. Because but, you, you refused to do that or you didn't want to participate in that? Well, I started off just questioning it and yeah. then didn't want to participate. And then at some point I refused to do it. <laughs> so, and I've, I've gone through that kind of evolution with, you know, many times over when I, as I found injustices, like, with psychiatric medications. You know, at first I was forced to uh, prescribe them as a trainee because that was the standard of care. And then, you know, in all my subsequent, su subsequent clinical work, that was the main function of a psychiatrist. But as I uncovered that one, first I saw the medicines were not helpful. And then I started realizing that they were harmful. And this was when I scrutinized the research literature and then compared it with my own experiences. I started seeing that there was consistency here in those respects, but that's not what the main authorities of medicine were saying about it, but that's what was in the actual research findings. And can, you, can, I, can I have you flesh that out a little bit? Just so a person says they're depressed, you know, and you hear this and, you know, I, I know a, a, enough about psychiatry to know <clears throat> that antidepressants actually don't really work. But what, when you say they didn't work, what, what were you seeing there that made you think they didn't work? Because oh, you do get occasionally people will say, yeah, I feel better or something like that. But Yes. Well, so for me, like I want to look at um, objective outcome measures. Yeah. So in other words, like something tangible that's improved in a person's life. Right. So like, if they're depressed and they can't function, right? They can't shop for groceries or take care of their kids or go to work. Well, I wanna see them resume doing those things. 
right? If they have a horrible conflict in their uh, important relationships in their life, I want to see that relationship improve, right? Um, all of those aspects. And that's what I, I was not seeing at all. Um, with, so certainly with antidepressants, I never saw that. I don't want to give the impression that no psychiatric drug ever works in any person for anything good. Like there are some very limited examples, right. but, they're, but they're rare and they're probably overused and overgeneralized. Um, but with antidepressants, no, I've never seen one person have a true benefit from an antidepressant. And, and quite frankly, the, all of the clinical trials, if you look at it as a body of evidence rather than picking out individual studies, you will realize that there actually is no specific activity of antidepressants uh, to address depression. Um, what I've observed in my experience that they do is they basically numb people's emotions. So they become more apathetic and less uh, emotionally intense, but, but they don't, as a result of that, don't improve yeah. their situation. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, they misinterpret the fact that I, I, uh, the, the way I would interpret that is they have a conflict or they have something that needs to be resolved in their life. Like I need to figure out how to deal with my children or my wife or my job or my job sucks or whatever. And I need to figure out how to do that. And they misinterpret that as being depressed. You give them an antidepressant and then they just live with their job. Well, you know, the, the whole term depression is really problematic. Yeah, right. Um, and because, well, what is it? So, you know, one of the things that I was doing is I was doing expert witness work. And so that allowed me to review just thousands and thousands of pages of medical records. And most of those were from primary care type doctors, but all of the medical records I review have to do with mental illness. And so I've seen thousands of times, right, where you see a diagnosis of depression be made, but there's, there's absolutely um, no depth to it at all. It's pretty much goes like this. Uh, a patient walks into the office, says, doc, I'm feeling depressed. The doctor says, are you thinking of suicide? They say no. And then diagnosis right. depression and then prescription right. for, you know, antidepressant of the day. Right. And, and that's really all it is. Now, I actually think, wouldn't even say depression is an illness. Yeah. I would say it's a symptom. Um, and, it's, and it's a kind of a vague symptom because like, well, what's the difference between depression and anxiety? A lot of people conflate those two things. Right. Um, and maybe they are together, one thing, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that at all, but, I, but it's important how to get the details of a person's experience. But mm -hmm. But feeling depressed or even to the point of being suicidal and not able to, you know, motivate yourself to do anything in your life can have so many different causes. And those causes could be purely physical and they could yeah. be purely emotional or psycho psychological or spiritual, um, or they could be more commonly a mixture of all of those things. Right. And when you, you know, simply give the drug, you're not even acknowledging that those things exist. You're just saying that it's actually a brain problem, a brain chemistry problem, and I'm going to correct the brain chemistry. Right. But there's yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm no, say, no scientific evidence yeah. of brain, yeah. right. brain chemistry abnormality. Right. Exactly. So, but, but, you know, like, you know, that uh, we do know that, you know, people with Parkinson's disease get depressed. We do know that people with heart attacks get depressed, right? And, and so there could be a relationship there, but then what you would do is address the heart attacks and address the Parkinson's, <laughs> right. right? Not numb out their emotions uh, because right. if you're going to do that, well, you might as well just use alcohol or cannabis or opium um, because there's not that much of a difference and those things are probably more pleasant than Prozac. Right. In fact, one could argue that it's an appropriate response to be saddened by the fact that you just had a heart attack. Absolutely. May, maybe there's some good in that that you might want to change what you do or how you eat or something, you know. 
Well, you know, I, I firmly believe that our emotional experience is for the purpose of giving us information yeah, right. what to, do to fix our situation. Right. It's mm-hmm. a communication strategy. Right. And if we try to suppress or run away from that, then we're not going to learn the lesson, whatever that may be. So then how do you go, how did we go from that to, uh, you know, Beauchamp, pleomorphism, <laughs> uh, t- terrain, and maybe even, I would love to hear your take on pleomorphism and m- probably a lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about with that, but I, I think it's a key and maybe, maybe that's the next step here. Well, you know, um, as I sort of went through that process, I reached a point where I'm like, I'm not going to prescribe any psychiatric medications with very, very limited exceptions. Um, And then, you know, something changed. I started looking at other areas of medicine. I had this experience where I tried uh, Dr. Kelly Brogan's protocol from her book, A Mind of Your Own, with somewhat a former colleague who was asking me for a referral. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about that. This could be a really good thing. You want to try it. And we kind of both did this protocol together. And that was the first time that any psychiatric uh, patient, you know, she wasn't my patient technically, but anyone with a a real psychiatric problem was completely cured a hundred percent. Wow. And it happened within a couple of weeks, and we had to fumble around with some experimentation after that to determine that it was caused by eating wheat products like bread. And whether it's gluten or glyphosate or whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as she stayed away from that food, there was no anxiety. Whenever she challenged herself with that food, the anxiety came back. And this was a major aha moment for me because I, I didn't know there could be a cure for something like that. How many years ago was this? This was uh, about maybe three to four years ago. Uh, so not that long ago. No, not, not that long ago at all. Uh-huh. But that opened me up to like saying, well, you know, maybe there's ways to heal from all of these things that I was told that there isn't. And maybe there's a whole new science that I'm unaware of that would explain this. And I just started studying. And um, I, you know, found certain people in this space that I thought were, uh, you know, knew what they were talking about. And I started consuming their material, you know, people like Anne Baroque and and Jennifer Daniels um, and others. And spent, you know, like pretty much two solid years just studying all of that. And I was more focused on how do I work with people to help them or what, what things work to help with various illnesses. And then when I felt like I had a pretty basic um, competency in that knowledge, um, I started thinking about doing consultations, but I also shifted into looking now more at some of the underlying science. And germ theory came up because some of the people that I were, was um, listening to, like Jennifer Daniels, she talked about like Koch's postulates not being satisfied. And I had like, oh, I heard about Koch's postulates in medical school. And I familiarized myself with that and said, well, that's really interesting that for hepatitis C, and she might have mentioned one or two other things. I'm like, wow, they never satisfied Koch's postulates. So I like, maybe I should look into that. And I came across um, uh, Bear Lando and yeah. um, his channel, Alpha Vedic. And they had done a show uh, talking about germ theory. And I listened to that and I was just blown away. And this was like last November. So it was before the current situation hit. And um, I was open to it. And I started looking into terrain theory at that time. I learned about pleomorphism and the, uh, you know, the cycle. Um, And I was, you know, exploring that at the same time, I was actually doing a whole bunch of, of law research. And it wasn't until after the pandemic situation hit that I really looked at viruses. So all everything that I've learned and been talking about viruses is very new. And I just felt like I had to understand what was going on. 
And I, so I was like, you know, once I, th- I had this suspicion when things were in, in China that it didn't make sense that they were doing all these crazy uh, measures because like, well, when did they do that before? And, you know, I just, something made my nose twitch about it. And I'm like, I want to see, you know, where they discovered this virus and look at the papers. Yeah. And I didn't know how to read those papers. You know, I had to learn how to read them because they use their own language. Right. Um, and then I came across, you know, uh, Stefan Lanka and Carrie Mullis and, you know, kind of the rest is history. But I was already did all this kind of preliminary work before I was able to really open myself up to get to these deeper underlying areas. And uh, to be honest with you, there are other areas I haven't had a chance to really explore yet. I'm kind of like, you know, what Gilbert Ling talks about, that many of the foundations of the current molecular and cell biology that I learned at MIT are actually not correct. Like even things as fundamental as how DNA works, um, right? And genetics and epigenetics. I think that we really don't understand that in an accurate way. Uh, sense right now. Um, But it's really, really hard to question it because it's such a fundamental thing as well, right? And how the cell works. Uh, What's the role of electricity? You know, what about water? Like water wasn't, it was just, you know, well, everything has to be in water, but water has no role other than that, just providing a nice ambiance, you know? And now, obviously, there's way, way more science to water and water could just in and of itself be a healing agent, right? And uh, and I actually, just from the amount of water, I find many of the clients that come to me are severely dehydrated, and that's one of the primary causes of their problems. Um, so, you know, it's like there, there's so much to explore here, and, um, you know, I'm still an early kind of pioneer in this exploration, but uh, but that's how I came to, you know, the germ theory and the virus dogma. Um, stories. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with me. There's this endless sort of peeling the onion layer. And to, to me, it's sort of all about asking myself, how do I know that for sure? And, um, you know, it's in some ways an uncomfortable question, or at least it used to be. But now it's, for, at least for me, it's become a fun question. Right. Like, like because... You know, it's like, it's like I said, when you get to whether it's the listeria in the milk that's making you sick or the milk, I ended up thinking, what difference does it make to me? <laughs> right, just stop with the dairy. <laughs> yeah. If, you know, if it's the listeria, you kill the bacteria. If it's the milk, you stop poisoning the cow. You know, like, it's no skin off my nose. Which, right. which no, of absolutely. those? I just want to get to the right information that's going to help people get better. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, when I was doing that clinical research, that's what it was all about. I wasn't like, okay, you know, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'd be willing to try do, using this thing that I think was totally crazy because it could actually work, right? And then if I see the evidence that it works, then I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. There must be a reason it works, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, but but when when I went down this germ theory rabbit hole and discovered terrain theory, right, which is um, you know I think much much closer to the truth, I had this realization that oh my god, all, almost all these natural healing approaches that I've learned about that are successful, they're all based on terrain theory. Yeah, and I didn't make that connection, you know, initially. Um, and it's not like the, these other people that are putting educational, they didn't like say it that way, right? It wasn't like, you know, you go into uh, terrain theory 101 or natural healing 101 in the university, but it, it's really profound. And so that matches up, yeah. right? It's like, so my understanding of terrain theory and what works in, in clinical medicine actually correspond. They're in agreement with each other now. And I didn't have that experience with the the theories in the allopathic medical model. Got it. And, and in fact, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think even the people who are actually using what we would call terrain theory, they, they typically themselves don't understand that. And they say, for instance, I'm giving 
you know, bowel cleansing to stimulate the antibodies so it gets rid of the viruses. Right, right. And you think, wait a minute. <laughs> First of all, I did a whole riff on antibodies, but... Um, yes, I love that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's very complicated and it basically doesn't mean anything. But, uh, but yeah, so even it's, it's that's, that sort of conceptual shift is hard for people to make. So, they, so can you give us a, uh, what is pleomorphism and what is the terrain theory in a nutshell? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can try that. And, but I, let me just add one thing to introduce that. It's like, because I think that a large portion of people these days have actually gotten terrain theory-based treatment. They just didn't know it, like you said. And it, anybody who takes, um, you know, um, bacteria, right, like probiotics, yeah. that's a terrain theory treatment. Right. You just didn't realize it, right? right? And I think that's a way to really open this topic up to people because all of the modern research about the microbiome really is terrain theory and it's uh you know a hundred years behind <laughs> the um you know the introduction of it but it but it's it's the exact same model and it just hasn't gotten to the point yet where it's taken over as the main paradigm but it's really hard to reconcile like how can bacteria be good and bad right Right. It's, uh, it's a contradiction. So it's got to be reconciled at some point. But essentially what terrain theory... I'll tell you, Andy, another uh, terrain theory, you may not have thought about this, is LDL. Now, I had a, a good friend uh, who was doing a lot of research on cholesterol. And he actually wrote a, a paper called The Benefit of High Cholesterol. And he demonstrated in a sense that high LDL is very protective against what we call infections. And so one of the ways of, of essentially poisoning people to make them more susceptible to what we call infections is to give them statin drugs to lower their LDL. And then they just appear, they get sick more often. And in a sense, you could also call that uh, eating butter terrain theory. Right. Or, eat, or eating bacon, terrain theory, because you're in, improving the, the very substances in us, which actually keep our you know, tissues and cell membranes flexible and so not sick. Absolutely. And, you know, cholesterol is uh, one of the things that's, you know, highly problematic, obviously, because there was this basically... Uh, conspiracy between the government and the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry to make us think that cholesterol is causing all of this illness right. when, when in fact it's it's really the opposite and you know cholesterol is uh the the starting material for so many things in our body like every membrane of every cell right and and the membranes take up a large area of the brain so it's right. like ninety percent of the dry weight of the brain, and then like it, all of your uh, steroid hormones and vitamin D are all made from it, mm -hmm. right? So think about the function of all those things, and if you're deficient in those things, you're not going to be in good health. Right. <laughs> and uh, and I think when when cholesterol got implicated as being bad, because if you have an excess of toxins deposited in your blood vessel, they actually oxidize the cholesterol. And when it's in its oxidized form, then it can do bad things because it could like activate the clotting cascade or things like that, or cause an inflammatory reaction, right? Or, or spread free radical damage. So it like it, but it's not the cause, right? It's a bystander, just, just right. the same way the bacteria um, in an infection are not the cause of the infection. They, they're there actually for a beneficial purpose. Right. Um, you know, in that case, and that that's what terrain theory says is that illness is not caused by microorganisms, microorganisms that invade your body or, or are already in your body, but it's caused by a perturbation or a negative alteration in the terrain or the ecosystem of the body. 
right? And that can occur a variety of things. It could be a physical trauma that, you know, damages your tissues and organs, could be uh, exposure to various types of toxic agents, which could be radiation, electromagnetic or ionizing radiation as well, and even a psychological toxic insult, right? Um, or a nutritional deficiency um, okay. that your body can't, you know, repair itself or build itself properly. And that so one of those things interrupts or damages the terrain of the body, and that is the cause of the illness. And what happens is that microorganisms are actually summoned by a process that we don't fully understand, but it involves your body systems like they, it's in conjunction with our immune system and other bodies, our circulatory system and such. And that microorganisms develop and differentiate specifically to respond to that particular type of insult. And they go there to perform saprophytic function right? To clean up the dead debris, help and to help the body repair, remove the toxins. And that's why they make secretions, right? Like mucus and such, because that's a way of getting those waste products out of the body. They create inflammation and swelling to increase the blood supply to that area to bring nutrients and take away waste products. We, we might be uncomfortable during that process, but this is the rebuilding phase, the healing phase of the illness. And the aspect about how our body summons these species of microorganisms is the pleomorphism that you were alluding to, that basically there are these uh, primordial forms of all these microorganisms, and there are a few different names. Beicham called them microzyma. Yeah. Um, they were also called somatids, um, and there's a couple of other names I can't think of at the moment. But you can, if you look under um, a microscope, like a dark field microscope, uh, where you can see live blood samples um, uh, and look at a blood sample there, you can see these and they look like little specks of light. And what happens is that these little specks of light or somatids, when the body calls upon them, there's some kind of signal, they start changing their shape and getting bigger. Right. And that's what pleomorphism means is many shapes or the ability to, to change shape. And they basically go through this cycle. It's known as the cyclogeny where they change shape multiple times and go through different stages. And at some point they become the like terminally differentiated species that's going to go to the site of disease in your body and clean it up. And there's, uh, you know, very specific information about what's the right species for what, you know, for, for all these different kind of disease situations that it could occur in your body. And they could not only form all the species of bacteria that we know about, but all the one, all the species of fungi that we know about, right. Including yeasts like candida, uh, which, you know, we commonly associate. And there are ver a variety of models that look at this, like one model, um, you know, talks about how if something is not addressed acutely and corrected, that it can progress to a chronic state and then the species of microorganisms change um, over time, right, and, and become more towards yeast. And so there's a lot of more depth understanding, but essentially what, the, what I'm saying is that these microorganisms are uh, essential in our recovery from any type of illnesses. So essentially what happens then uh, is we have these, and I know when you read Beichamp, he, he calls them a sort of foundational uh, state of life, you know, that they're almost uh, completely indestructible, these micro -zymers. Kind of like uh, you, could, you could call them like microorganism stem cells. Yes. And, and, even though, you know, the conception in microbiology standard that we learn is that there's a strep and there's a listeria and there's an anthrax and they, they're all like these, they're like monkeys and zebras and they, they have nothing to do with each other. They're, whole, they're completely different organisms. What these people, we're talking Rife, we're talking Gaston Naissance, we're talking Beichamp, there's a few other ones, I think, through the years, actually said, 
what happens is it depends on the conditions that they're found in. In other words, whether we're talking oxygen level or toxicity or pH or, or who knows, you know, it's a, it's, life can be complex. It might be an electrical field or, or something, but there's some generating purpose. And then the microorganisms essentially, uh, I don't know if the word evolve, but, but sort of go become created almost based on the stimuli. Mm -hmm. which seems perfectly normal, except apparently in about 1890, if you said pleomorphism, you were not allowed to be published in a conventional medical journal from well, then on. I think that holds true, you know, to the present day. But, yeah. you know, this, this fits really, um, it corresponds well with our understanding of how stem cells become differentiated cells, right? Because in our own body, right, in, you know, when we're a developing fetus, right? All the cells are what they call pluripotential stem cells, which means they could become any kind of cell in your body. Right. right? And they go through a process just like pleomorphism. I mean, you could even call it that um, really uh, where they slowly develop through progenitors in, you know, a continuous evolution and change of shape into becoming a kidney cell or a pancreatic right. islet cell or a skin cell or a squamous cell, like there are a million different kinds. Right. And so we're not really talking about anything different from that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so where's, where does a virus uh, fit into that picture? Well, um, so, you know, it, it's a little bit challenging to talk about virus because you want to be careful about exactly what, what it is that you're talking about it. So <laughs> no there's, like, there's <laughs> like, you know, the virus, which means poison, but even before there was ever an electron microscope where they could possibly see what they're calling a virus these days, they already blamed a virus on several illnesses, right. um, specifically ones that they couldn't find bacteria. Uh, associated with like polio, oh, okay. right? So there's one thing like that where there's like this kind of virus hunt by medical researchers trying to find something that causes diseases that they don't have another explanation that they're looking at. But, but then there's also what has come out of the bacteriology research with bacteriophages. And bacteriophages or bacteria eaters, they're called, and I think that term is actually a misnomer, um, is considered a model for viruses. And in fact, the original genetic sequences of viral genes um, were garnered from bacteriophages because they, bacteriophages, um, I think most objectively exist when you have artificial conditions on bacteria mostly. So you were talking about how, you know, bacteria, um, exist in nature. And one of the things is you never see an isolated variety of bacteria, species of bacteria in nature. There are always dozens or even hundreds of different types of bacteria mixed together, growing right in the same community. And they all exchange genetic information with each other. It's really only in the laboratory that scientists separate out the species and try to grow a pure culture of bacteria. And they're capable of doing this, but the bacteria are not healthy. They're, they're under stress in this situation. And, but if you add more stress to the situation, what you'll see is that, the, the back, that you'll see the presence of these phages in the bacterial culture. And you'll see the cells disappearing. But the scientists that originally discovered this and called them back. When you say the cells disappear, you mean the bacterial cells disappear. Bacterial cells disappear and phages appear to be eating them. Yeah. But I think that this was a bit misinterpreted because one of the main aspects is that in, in, our, in the modern mainstream medical science, they only look at dead things under a microscope. They don't look at living things. And when you observe dead things, it's very hard to take those observations and be sure that you can describe behavior that resulted in that. I mean, imagine trying to, you know, uh, learn about uh, human ritual behavior from examining cadavers of humans. <laughs> right. <Or, laughs> it would be, be impossible. Right. So I, if, I often say that 
the fundamental problem with Western science was <clears throat> we wanted to learn how to help frogs. So the first thing we did was kill the frog, yes, exactly. which, which I can guarantee did not help that frog. Uh, you, you know, it's it's uh, it's funny these uh, lapses in, in logic and common sense sometimes. Yeah, right. But so if you look at the dead bacteria under the microscope, you can see oh, there's less cells over less bacterial cells over time and more phages. They must be consuming the bacteria and reproducing. But another explanation is that they actually turn into the phages. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, when, right. Well, when back, so when bacteria are under environmental stress in nature, when they're in a mixed culture, they turn into spores, generally speaking, yeah. and the spores can withstand the harsh environmental conditions. And then when they're right, the conditions return to normal, then they revert back into a, a, a living growing state. And when they're in the laboratory under artificial conditions, when the bacteria are stressed even more, they can be induced into phages. But the bacteriophages are, are interesting scientifically because one is they've, they've actually been shown clearly to exist. So they take a bacteria culture, do certain things to induce phages, and then they can put it in a centrifuge and separate the bacterial cells from the phages, and then look under a microscope, an electron microscope, because you need that level of magnification and see just wall to wall phages in your sample. So, you know, it's pure. And, and then, and another interesting thing is they have a very characteristic geometrical shape. So they're not spherical particles. They are actually structured particles and they, they look a little bit like the space needle in Seattle, but uh, on Stanford website, they have great pictures. Um, if anyone wants to look for themselves, uh, but since these are pure particles, um, you can then basically characterize what chemicals are in the particles because you know it's only coming from that since it's pure. So yeah. you can like, uh, you know, uh, lyse the membrane and take the genetic material out and then it'll be in one intact piece. Yeah. And you sequence it end to end and then say this is the genome of, of this if it has a genome, you know. Um, and then you can look at the proteins in the membrane or the, how the membrane, you can do further, you know, chemical tests on it. So you can know exactly how that thing is structured and what it is. And so they've been able to do this kind of scientific methodology for other, you know, what they call viruses that are in uh, single celled organisms like amoeba and sea algae. Uh, are some other examples and many different species of bacteria, not just one, like there are many different types of bacteriophages. I've even worked with them in the laboratory when I was in college. Yeah. So it's a pretty common thing. So, and I think your point there is this idea that you sometimes hear, well, it's so complicated to isolate, purify, and characterize is actually not true. No, not at all. It's just, I, it's just part of, normal bacterial phage research. That's so what you do. Even before they could look under the microscope, they already were able to separate out what they thought were viruses from bacteria and other organisms by filtering. Yeah. And, you know, you can go back to turn of the century papers on viruses and they basically, you know, took some diseased tissue from a, from a person or an animal and filtered all the cells out and then, you know, that it was basically toxic and it, and it could, if they gave it to some other animal the right way, it could sometimes cause illness. And so they said, well, there must be a virus in there, right? But they didn't know what it was, but they knew they would separate it out. So the first thing you could do is just put it, put it sample through a filter because virus particles are what they say they are is so much smaller than any other type of cell right? You could separate it from any other type of cell, right? Bacteria, fungi, mammal cells, human cells, just by filtering it. So that yeah. would be an obvious thing that you could do. And that's not full purification, but you know, this is something that you could do in an hour or two in the laboratory. It's not complicated, right? We've right. used the things in our kitchen sometimes. <laughs> so, so, but then the, the next step is after you filter it is that you do what they call density gradient centrifugation. 
And, you know, centrifuge is just a fast spinning thing. You put it in a test tube in a medium that has a density gradient because the spinning separates things by density. And all things of the same density will basically be in a little tight band on the test tube. And then you can take a syringe or a pipette and, and take that and then do experiments on it. And, and it may take a little practice, like how long do you run the centrifuge, you know, like right. which filter do you use? Do you filter more than once? Like, of course, all those things, you know, it's, it's harder when you're in the lab to do things than theoretically, but we're talking about technology that's been around for a long time. Yeah. Like a centrifuge is not a new high tech device and neither is a filter, right? right? They were able to filter things uh, over a hundred years ago. Um, so why aren't they doing these basic uh, steps when they do science related to viruses that they say cause disease? And they did try to do that when they started off. But what happened is that they, what they observed was there was no predominant particle that was there that was identical to itself. There were mixtures of all kinds of debris and particles. And they basically were about to give up before they got to these um, tissue culture experiments. Right. Um, and I think you wanted to ask me about that, so I'll stop there. Yeah, but I, I think it's, it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is one of the other things that I know Stefan Lenka ta always talks about that virology disproved itself is they did learn to filter and isolate and purify. And they had... <clears throat> Uh, cultures, maybe not of a pure single virus, but at least pure, quote, viruses or these bacteriophages. And then they, they would introduce those to normal animals, you know, who weren't sick, and they couldn't make any of them sick. I mean, <laughs> it was like, all right, we did it. We, we did it the way we're supposed to. We have, the, we have the thing we're looking for. We squirted it down a hamster's hamster and monkeys and breathed into people's mouth, nothing happened. Let's go home and be farmers. Listen, with, uh, with polio, they, it's unbelievable how yeah, right. they tried, right, to, to make an animal sick. They took, you know, basically dead babies who died of polio and ground up their brain and spinal cord in a blender and, you know, gave it to all these monkeys. And eventually they had to inject it directly into the monkey's into the brain. brain. Yeah. Sick. But if you inject anything into a monkey's brain, it'll right. make it sick, you know? Right. They might yeah. herniate their brain <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you no, know, like uh, we, um, we didn't mention the word exosome today, but, right, exosomes are also uh, small particles that are about the same size as they say viruses are. And they're made by our own cells. But when the same researchers that are unable to purify virus particles can purify exosome particles, no problem. Yeah, right. Like you look at those papers, they do the same procedure I described with filtering and centrifuge that they did for bacteriophages, and they're able to characterize the exosomes very well because yeah. they have pure, a pure sample of it. And I, I happen to read the minutes of the 1973 Pasteur Institute conference, and they actually uh, outlined the steps for how you would know that there's a new virus. And it's basically exactly what you said, filter and centrifuge and purify and characterize. And, and it was very clear and doable, and they just don't do it. So with that, how do they do a viral culture? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, interesting and quite astonishing. But what they do is they take basically the raw sample from the sick person. So like, you know, they, they want to look at a virus that supposedly makes someone sick, right? So they have a sick person and depending on what part of their body is sick, they take a tissue or fluid from that part of the body. Um, so like, let's say it causes a lung infection, they would take lung fluid, Okay. Um, and that is a very m dirty sample because it has many, many things in it, many different kinds of cells, many different chemicals floating around in it, genetic material, etc. They don't filter that. <laughs> they, they, what they do is they add that to a cell culture 
And the cell culture cells are not generally not human cells. They are sometimes. Um, there was one paper I saw where they used uh, lung cancer cells from a human. Right. Um, but they're usually monkey kidney cells. That's the most common one. But these are like commercially available cell culture, right? right that you could just buy. Egg yolk stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they could, you could culture these things on egg yolk probably. But, but what they do in, the, in these virus experiments is that they, um, they use minimal growth media. So in other words, the, just the basic amount of nutrition that the cells need to survive. Right not thriving type level of nutrition. Right. Then they add uh, usually um, uh, bovine calf serum. So like the blood product, the non-cellular blood product from a baby cow, um, which could have lots of things, foreign proteins in it that could cause damage uh, to a cell. Then they add antibiotics. Um, and they don't always specify which ones they add, but the reason is they say, well, they don't want any, you know, bacteria to contaminate the sample. Right. But I thought this was really interesting, Tom, because uh, you, you're familiar with amphotericin B, right? Yes. Yeah, fungal. So, you know, they, terrible. terrible, exactly. Right. And we know it's very toxic and it's like you know, if someone's about to die is when they get amphotericin B um, and it's an antifungal antibiotic. And one of the main toxicities it has is to the kidney. Well, they mixed it with kidney cells. So what do you think might happen there, right? So all the antibiotics that they mix, they're all toxic to cells. Like antibiotic means against life. Yeah. Um, and they're also antibiotics are known to induce cells to make exosomes. Right. So, so there's the, the calf serum, there's the, the minimal nutrition, and then there's the toxic antibiotics. And there may be some other things like some buffers and things like that. Um, but that, that's the main recipe. And then they add in this contaminated lung fluid from someone who's got pneumonia in with that cell culture. Now, then they observe the cell culture for several days and they're looking for what they call cytopathic effects. Right. So in other words, non-specific damage to the cells. Now, right. of course, if you mix a cell culture with a bunch of toxic things, um, and by the way, there are many things that could be toxic in that lung fluid as well yes. from a sick individual. Um, it's not that surprising that you'll see damage to the cells. And when cells undergo damage, they behave in predictable ways. So early on, they would basically send out alarm signals. Um, and one of those would be by putting out exosomes. And we know in these cell cultures, they're always going to do that because we gave them antibiotics. And we know from other research that antibiotics plus cells gives you exosomes. Right. Um, and then when the cells start degrading, they basically... Um, put off all these kinds of vesicles, like little, they, they fragment. And this process can go, you know, all the way to complete uh, destruction of the cell. Um, but the, you know, various different constituents get packaged up in the, in the membrane as it pinches off and forms these little particles or vesicles. And this is a protective uh, mechanism to the body because if the cells released all the contents into your circulation, they would damage other parts of your body. Right. So yep. containing them in these little vesicles as part of the dying process is, is a, a helpful thing. And basically what they do is that they look under the microscope at all of these particles in the damaged tissue and they find one that they, they say is the virus. And then they show a picture of that. But what they don't do is they don't show pictures of the other particles or the exosomes and say, oh, here's where we found an exosome and here's where we found the virus particle and here's how we can tell one is one and one is the other. They, they also don't then take that cell culture mishmash and do the filtering and right. uh, centrifuge and purify it out of that. So you, you never see like a, a, a picture from the microscope where the entire visual field of the slide is virus particles and they all look identical, right? In fact, even when they write about the sizes, right? There's 
sometimes they write that the particles range in size more than double. Right. Imagine if, you know, you say, well, okay, some humans are as short as four feet. Uh, I mean, so, sorry, some humans are six feet and some humans are 12 feet, yeah. right? Range from six to 12 feet. It, most animals don't have that much of a range in their, you know, size. But all these things, it's like you'd expect to find something that is homogeneous. Right. Uniform. Right? Yeah. And, and uniform, right? And that's uh, not, what, not what they're seeing. You know, and to me, because as you know, I always think in analogies and metaphors that the thing that's so interesting about the process of viral culture is the way that a viral culture is done to produce this cytopathic effect is basically starving and poisoning the tissue. Absolutely. Which, which is not unlike how people get sick. <laughs> <laughs> You starve, and in, in, in fact, we, it's like we learned, it, to me, what that proves is if you take a tissue and you want to damage it or kill it, or an organism, basically starve and poison it, and you got a really good shot at, at hurting it. Exactly yeah. right, and, and I can just hear a, an indoctrinated virologist give you a counter-argument, well, we're just making the cell more vulnerable to the virus so that we can highlight the virus effects. Yes. Right. <laughs> Except that why don't you do a control and just put uh, saline and purified virus with a healthy, nourished, unpoisoned tissue and see what happens. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's an excellent point. And that, that is like Stefan Lanka right now is trying to raise funds to actually do a negative right. control experiment. And, you know, it's, it's not trivial because you'd have to do really two negative controls. Um, one where you don't, you add saline instead of the lung fluid, but there should be another one where you have the lung fluid of a healthy individual yeah. um, that you add to the culture. Yeah. All right. Well, let's finish with one more thing, which is you hear a lot about, yes, but they have the entire genome of this virus. <laughs> and first of all, I mean, uh, if you don't pure, it's the, again, I have an analogy. It's like uh, if I said, you know, Andy, there's a flying saucer over your head right now. And you might say, Tom, how do you know that? And I would say, well, I hear a whooshing noise through my mic microphone here. And you would say, well, that doesn't actually prove it. I was thinking you might say, I see it over your head. Well, right. no, I don't see it. But, but I do see these little pieces of iron filing under your chair. And even though I've never actually seen or, in, or analyzed a flying saucer, I know that those iron filings could have only come from a flying saucer. And you might think I'm a lunatic because how do you know they didn't come from the chair or, or uh, an airplane or something like that? So, you know, if, to take that to the next logical step, right? So if you already characterized flying saucers and knew that, that they existed and were able to study their structure, right? and said that there's a cert specific iron alloy that they use, yeah. right? Then you, then you can look yeah. at these iron filings and say, this is the specific flying saucer yeah. iron alloy, right? Right. But, but absolutely correct what you said. You can't take the iron filings and say, from this, I proved that flying saucers exist. And by trying to say that the genome proves the virus exists, that's exactly what you're doing. Because, you know, well, where did this genome come from? If you didn't prove that there's a virus first, where did you get the genome from? Um, so, you know, it has, to, it has to go in that logical uh, progression. But um, they, they bypass that completely. And they do this in such a way. So, like, they might say that the genome sequence is discovered or that there is a genome for a virus. But what would be a much more accurate description would be that they discovered a theoretical computer model of a genome of a theoretical alleged virus. Yes. Right. That would be accurate to describe it because what they do is like you, you say, like let's think, how did they do the human genome project? Right now they, they didn't mix humans 
with uh, hundreds of other species of animals and put them in a blender and take out little fragments of, of DNA and, and put it together and say, these are human, right? What they did is they had, we knew what a human was. Um, and then we had a pure human and we took out some material from that pure human and it was still contaminated. Right. But, yeah. uh, but we, we did some steps to make sure like, cause we tested from a hundred other humans and we found the same thing in each one, for example, right. Or we validated it in some way, yeah. but what they're doing with this, the, with viral genomes is they're taking that sample. Like I discussed with the tissue culture, like a lung fluid sample, and they're pre-identifying viral sequences. So they say, okay, this is a, a coronavirus, or this is a uh, rhinovirus, or this is you know, a lentivirus, whatever they think they're looking for. They go to a computer database, which contains other sequences that they've determined in the same manner, by the way. Yeah. And they, they develop small PCR probes from those sequences, so that from a, from a library, basically they say, okay, we know this is a sequence from another similar virus. So let's find if this sequence is present in this lung fluid sample. And what they do is they take dozens or maybe hundreds of these primers um, uh, to start with, and then whatever they identify, they they pull out little fragments that have that part of the sequence and then have another sequence after it, right? And these fragments might be 200 to 300 bases long. Um, and then they sequence those. And then they make primers based on those sequences to find like, well, a piece that would attach to it, right? Um, and they make a whole, what they call a cDNA library of fragments like this. Okay, now in one paper I looked at, um, they had over 20,000 fragments of, of genetic material. So very different from starting with an intact organism, pulling out the intact genome in one piece or, you know, in, in one chromosome pieces, you know, depending on the organism, and then being able to know exactly how, you know, you maybe can break it into smaller pieces for sequencing, but you know exactly what goes where because you started with the whole. Right. In this case, you're starting with pieces. So, so then you, so you have like 20,000 fragments that are 200 to 300 bases long. And, and the, the genome is allegedly 30,000 bases long. So a lot of these fragments um, and there's overlap and there's gaps and such. And when they sequence all these fragments, then they put them into a computer program and the computer program basically solves the puzzle and puts them into one piece. Yeah. But there, there's, of course, errors because there are gaps, right, where there's not a continuous sequence. Um, then there's also, like, how do you put it together? How do you know which ends match up with which? You know, like, even if you do a jigsaw puzzle, right, you know there are some of those pieces that they are almost a perfect match, but when you put it in there, you got to use just a little bit of force so you know it's not right, right? Yeah. So, like, how do you know that the computer's not doing that. Um, how do they fill in the gaps? Well, they fill in the gaps, they go back to the library of sequence, try to find a sequence that's close and then just extrapolate it in there, you know, yeah. just fill it in from basically their imagination. Yeah. Um, so this, then they have, you know, after all this number crunching and the, I mean, they need a computer to do this because if they had people trying to do this by hand, they'd probably be working for, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Uh, before they could put it together. Um, and, but then they get something and they publish it and they say, this is the genome. Yeah. Got it. All right. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Any final words you have for our audience? Just a word of advice, encouragement, anything. Well, <laughs> maybe you know, in the, in the justice realm. Well, you know, I always say, don't take my word for it. Right. Because, yeah. I may be a meticulous researcher, but I'm still prone to making mistakes. Um, and so, you know, look at other sources, try to make your own decisions about things. I definitely think that's really important. And, um, you know, just want to emphasize that learning about this 
stuff and being open to new ideas is, I feel is very critical at this point in time because we're in the midst of major, major societal change at every level, right? And a lot of it is, uh, I mean, almost all of it is very oppressive and it's all rooted in this kind of medical manipulation. And so if we are stuck in a dogmatic view of our health and the medical system, we're going to continue to be vulnerable to this kind of, you know, medical tyranny, medical martial law, um, health technocracy, whatever word you want to use to describe it. Um, and my goal is to really, you know, try to educate people so that they're not vulnerable to that way of being manipulated um, any longer and, you know, allow them to basically, you know, stay as uh, free people okay. as much as possible. Great. All right, Andy. I so appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me today. Well, it's, it's definitely my pleasure, Tom. And uh, congratulations on your uh, new venture here, uh, speaking to the people on your, uh, on your platform. Yeah. Okay. And we will send you a copy of the new book, The Contagion Myth, uh, as soon as it comes out. Awesome. All right, Andy. Take care. All right. You too, Tom. Thanks. Okay.